right, we're going to do try two because I couldn't talk the last time. So weather and its basics. We're going to look that the sun um, provides energy for convection currents, which we studied when we looked at uh, the mantle and Earth's layers, and how these convection currents produce wind and ocean currents for us. And that the uneven heating between the land and the ocean drives every single weather pattern we have on our planet. So this is a really, you don't need to copy this down, but it's just a, a visual. There are um, five layers to our atmosphere. Uh, we are going to focus on this bottom three. So lo looking at the top, I would just copy down the things that are highlighted over here in the yellow. And yes, feel free to stop it if you need to. The exosphere is the th one of the thinnest. Um, it's the most outer layer of our atmosphere, and it's the beginning of true space. So there are some satellites that live here, but for the most part, it's just empty space. The thermosphere, and if you remember thermo, usually means heat. Uh, this is where the air is also really thin, but it's extremely hot in this area. Uh, this is where the space shuttle, as well as the International Space Station, orbit. And they orbit in the middle to upper part, so they're moving towards the exosphere. A natural occurrence that happens here is the Aurora Borealis. Um, it's the northern lights. And what those are is the magnetic field of Earth and the temperature being so hot and how they mix together and the charged particles as they move. So this is our focus. The mesosphere is the coldest layer, and it's as low as 90 degrees Celsius. To put that in Fahrenheit, if you look at the page, it is negative 130 degrees Fahrenheit. That is so stinking cold. Um, the air is really, really thin, um, but it's thick enough that it can burn up meteoroids that come through our planet. So it's a thick environment if we kind of scan back. I think it's one of the that goes. So this is 100 or 600 kilometers um, up off of us and then here's 85 kilometers. So it's not the thickest but it's um, the particles in the atmosphere are dense, dense enough that as it a uh, rock, a meteoroid comes through it gets burned up with the friction. The stratosphere is where the guy from Red Bull jumped from, and this is where most of our ozone is found. There are some weather balloons that get up into here, into this atmospheric, uh, but the guy from Red Bull was the first person to get that high and jump through. And then the one that we live in is the troposphere, and uh, this is the layer that's closest to our planet. This is where all of the weather flies, or moves, and then uh, jets and airplanes move within this layer. Uh, so you may need to pause this if you need some more information for any kind of weather presentation. Um, here's some more pictures. That link that's here, I will put this in the description. This is the Red Bull Jump. And so you can explore the mission and look at different parts to it. So these are some weather tools that you may need to know for your weather report that you have to do. A hydrometer measures humidity. Uh, the humidity is the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere that can uh, be attributed to condensation and evaporation. So if you remember your water cycle, the water vapor or the level of humidity would uh, tell you how much water is in the atmosphere. If you look at this hydrometer here, this green strip would be a reference point to, that's comfortable for most of us to live in. Come on, go computer. Then Hopefully you all know what a thermometer is. It measures temperature. Uh, mercury used to be used, but mercury is toxic if you ingest it. So they moved to an alcohol that they put a red food coloring in. Uh, when the alcohol is heated, and it's not the kind you can drink, so don't do it. It'll make you sick. Um, it's heated, and it, the liquid expands, and then that shows you as it moves up and down what your th temperature would be. Uh, most of them are calibrated to a specific um, unit of measurement, like Fahrenheit. That's what we use in the U.S. Most of uh, Canada uses Celsius. And then if you're doing science measurements, it can be used in Kelvin as well. Like if we were to measure temperatures of the stars, we use Kelvin because it can go up to a higher degree. 
Barometers uh, measure air pressure. This tells you whether the air pressure is rising or falling. And what that means is, is the air particles, are they getting dense, more dense, packed together, or spreading out? Um, so barometers using glass uh, filled with a liquid similar to mercury, kind of the same as with a uh, thermometer, but as it's as the air pressure pushes down on it, it causes the um, liquid to move up the glass tube that's in a vacuum. Wind socks are pretty self-explanatory. Hopefully you can kind of look at it and tell what it does. It is a thing that's used to measure the wind direction. So the wind goes through the sock and kind of points to the direction that the wind is moving. So if it's like here in this picture, the wind sock is pointing towards, towards the north. So it's actually coming from the south. It's counterintuitive, meaning it's the opposite. An anometer is a device that measures wind speed and wind pressure. And they look kind of like this, where they have the little cups on them, and then uh, they have a little pressure gauge here. So this is the water cycle. I will put this link also in the description so you can go through the little transportation world and find all the pieces of the water cycle if you have forgotten. Um, an aquifer, this is a vocab word that they threw at people a couple years ago and kids just bombed it because they forgot what an aquifer was. Well, an aquifer is an underground layer in the earth where permeable rock, which just means that there's holes, that just means there's holes in the rock. Uh, the rainwater seeps through this permeable rock and is collected underneath the ground. So an aquifer is basically just um, a collection for groundwater. Uh, they can usually get it out using a well, and that can be like an old-timey well with the little wheel and the bucket, or a pump-driven well, which is what most places use now. So this is a picture of how the land breeze and sea breeze work. You need to copy this down. I repeat, you need to copy this down. Um, you need to put the low and high pressure system in, and then this link here will also be in your description. It's a video that explains it pretty simple. So, all right, so this is going to pick up where the other one left off because uh, I was having technical difficulties. So looking at the picture here, uh, there's actually two. I moved it. Um, this one, if I get my pen out, my pen out, uh, our heat source, other than the sun, is the land because the land heats up faster than water and it actually retains its heat longer. So during the day, the if I asked you where's the hottest spot, hopefully you would be able to tell me that it's the land. So under over the land, the air mass over the land is starting to get warm. And as it gets warm, it actually uh, starts to rise. Well, before it can do that, it's actually uh, starting to spread out, so it becomes an area of low pressure. The molecules are all spreading out. Well, as it warms, it rises. Well, as it, the air molecules get to the top, they become more densely packed together, which means they're under an area of high pressure. Well, I'm sure most of us don't like to be under high pressure, so the air molecules spread out. As they spread out, they come out towards the ocean, and as they get over the ocean, now I have, oh, that's a horrible L. Now I have an area of low pressure again. Well, areas of low pressure, especially over the ocean, get cool and cold air sinks because it's become more dense, causing more dense molecules to get packed together. And then I get an area of high pressure. Again, it doesn't want to be under high pressure, so it spreads out again, giving us a sea breeze. So when the breeze is coming from the ocean, it is a sea breeze. Please don't make fun of my writing. I'm doing it with a computer mouse. So looking at the land breeze, it's almost the exact opposite uh, because the ocean, I feel like I need another color, I need a yellow, because the ocean has held on to its heat throughout the day, it is now the warmer area compared to the land because the land has let all of its heat out throughout the day. So here's where my area of low pressure starts. Warm air rises. It collects above the ocean. As it collects, it gets under high pressure. It starts to spread out. It goes over to the land area where it cools because the land is cooler. As it sinks, it's a 
horrible H. Uh, it gets into collections of um, high pressure, which causes it to want to spread out. So at night, because the breeze comes from the land, that's a horrible circle. That's where my, this would be called a land breeze. So some things to think about. The sun and the water cycle are directly and indirectly contributing to our weather system. The vastness or big space of our oceans affect how weather systems form, such as hurricanes. And then the energy that's transformed with, or transferred, excuse me, within the atmosphere um, either spurs on making the weather pattern grow larger. I have a feeling Beans is about to unplug my computer. Uh, as well as the altitude uh, within the atmosphere that the air pressure is originating from. These are all factors that contribute to weather. Uh, so convection currents, this link will be in the description. There's going to be lots of description links. Uh, convection currents are the transfer uh, within heated material. So this can be like water and shampoo and sunscreen. Even gases such as air can contribute to this, can be classified as a fluid because there is water vapor within the air. Uh, convection currents within our atmosphere distribute heat from the equator outwards towards the poles. So if you look, um, that's one of the reasons why the air, the atmospheric air is so much warmer near the equator. The sun being closer to those areas definitely contributes, um, but the reason that it retains so much heat even at night is because that's where the warm air is generating from. Um, we will have done this in class, so hopefully if you missed it, you have come to tutoring so that you can do this. We're going to take two little test tubes, one with warm water with some red food coloring and some with cold water and blue food coloring, an index card, and we're going to pull them apart and see what happens. So why do people and animals run across the hot sand into the cold water? Um, hopefully you know that sand if you've ever been to the beach, is much, much hotter than the water because the um, sand conducts and holds heat much better than the water does. Uh, so beaches and oceans, the sea breeze, remember, comes from the sea or the water source. Uh, and if you ever stood on a beach, then you know the winds come off of the water during the day and go out towards the water at night. Um, what causes our air currents to move? This is what was your exit card. So if you didn't answer it, you'll need to answer it and turn it in. And use the picture down below. Um, and then this is how does the sun really get all this atmospheric air heated and going? So the sun heats up the surface. The air next to the surface gets warm. And the air molecules try to spread out. As they spread, the air rises into the atmosphere. Um, the density has to do with how closely the molecules are packed together. We talked about this when we did chemistry, and this takes us to our air masses. Uh, warm air is less dense or lighter, so it tends to float. This is why you hear the people say, warm air rises. Uh, the higher it goes, the colder it gets. So at one point, it starts to cool off as the air gets up into the atmosphere because it's spread out so much. It gets too far out, and then it needs to collect again. As it cools off, it collects... Uh, Together, it condenses and becomes more dense, which causes those air molecules closer packed together to sink. Uh, so this makes our air constantly moving. And this is one of the reasons why we have different temperature zones or temperate zones, because our air masses are constantly cycling through themselves. Um, and this movement of air cycle actually causes us to have wind. 